and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now the word prophesy does not mean to teach. The prophesy means to either tell an experience or inspiration or foretell something that's fixing to take place. And we know that there was prophetess in the Old Testament. They never could speak out in the buildings, speak out in the churches and the congregation as a teacher. But she, Anne, and many of them in the temple, they were prophetess, and they were, Miriam was a prophetess or something like that. She had the spirit on her, that's true. But she had her limitations of place. Women can be prophetess today, absolutely. But not teachers and so forth behind the platform here. You do, you make, you make the Bible contradict itself. The Bible can't say one thing here, another thing over here. It's got to say the same thing all the time, or it isn't the Word of God. See? So your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Means that they shall either foretell or testify. Now you look that up and you get the Bible dictionary and see if that isn't right. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, the Bible also speaks of a woman who pretended her sir, or claimed that she, this would work both with the Catholic Church and would work also with, uh, with this subject we're uh, going to speak of. Now let's turn over to uh, the book of, of Revelations and let's get about the, um, the second chapter and the 21st just while we're right here close to that you might notice here and just see how the devilish that thing can be. Uh, speaking in this last days, what will take place? How that these, what this woman would be? Remember, the Catholic Church is a woman. We just read it, haven't we? Listen to this now. That's uh, Revelation two and twenty. Now we're standing. He's speaking to this uh, uh, Tyra Church. See, now we're standing, which is a middle-aged church there through the dark ages. Now we're standing. I have a few things against thee, because thou suffers that woman Jezebel which calls herself a prophetess to teach and subdue my servants and commit fornications and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, if you ever notice, watch these church ages. Then we'll close. And then in the morning we'll go pick up these other things. Watch. In the, under the, the golden candlesticks of the Jewish tabernacle in the inside of the showbread and so forth, there were seven golden candlesticks. All of you know that. See? The seven church ages. That speaks of seven church ages alike. Now, if you notice, in Revelations 1, we find Jesus standing in the seven church ages, the seven golden candlesticks. When he turned and saw one like the Son of Man, standing clothed with a, how it was, it was a bride standing in the candlesticks, drawn out. Now, in the Old Testament, they would take this, this one candle and light it, take the other candle and light off that one, light off that one, one off the other, and like that, till they made the entire seven candlesticks. If you'll notice at the beginning when God began to deal with the Jews and they went through the golden age and then the darkest age of the Jewish dealings God had with Jews was in the reign of Ahab. And if you'll notice reading those church ages there, he gets right back to it again. He said now a few things go and said now right in that dark age, 1500 years there, or the time of Ahab first in the Jews, the darkest age they had when Ahab married Jezebel and brought idolatry into Israel and made all the people worship after Ahab, uh, after Jezebel's God. You remember they took, put up the groves and took down the altars of God and Elisha cried out he was the only one and God had 700 who never bowed their knee to Balaam yet. You remember that? That's a type of that elect church coming out. See there? See how it is? Now in this church, if you'll notice, the first church, the first church, the church of Ephesus was a great church. He said, you got light yet. And if you notice, each church, it began to dim out. Dim out. Dim out. Until it got to Tyra. And then the 1500 years, then he come out on the other side, and you've got just a little life, strengthen that which you have got, lest your candlestick be removed. And it come on down then to the Philadelphia church age, and then into the Lady Ocean church age. Now, here's the beauty. Oh my, I just love this, Brother Smith. See, look at this. Now, in this church age, as we went through, now watch this. The first church age was the Ephesus, the Ephesian church age. Now, each one of those church ages, till he got to this 1,500 years, if you notice, read it now. When you go home tonight, if you have time, or early in the morning before you come to church, on the first, second, and third chapter of Revelation, you'll find out each one of those church ages, he said, you have a little strength and you haven't denied my name. Until he got to this 1,500 years of Tyra, the dark age, then he come out on the other side and said, you have a name that you live, but you are dead. And these, none of these other church ages, that or the Philadelphia church age, never did pick up that name again. Never got that name because it went out during this time. 
Now, oh, how we can lay that on to them false teachings now. Right in there, show it's a mother of the Catholic Church, a mother of all of it. How she's mother of Mystery Babylon. And that's, that, look, this church age here, when she come out, she had a little light. Then she went getting dimmer, dimmer. Then she come into an organization back here, this 1,500 years. And she come out now, not as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, but as the Catholic Church. What did Luther come out? As the Lutheran church. What did the Baptist come out? As the Baptist church. Not his name. Not his name. Another name. You have a name. For there's not another name given under heaven whereby you may be saved only in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have a name. That you're living but you're dead. That's what that denomination is. Oh, I'm a Presbyterian and you're dead. Oh, I'm a Baptist and dead. You're only alive as you come alive in Christ Jesus. That's right. Your false baptisms, water false baptisms, sprinkling poor instead of immersing, using Father, Son, and Holy Ghost instead of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All those false things coming right down the Bible, speaking right, pouring it into it just as hard as they can. Here we tolerate right along with them. But my church reads it this way. But the Bible says this. See? No such things. There's no such thing. That old place in the Bible did they ever stick out their tongue and take the Holy Eucharist and the priest drink the wine and call it the Holy Ghost? Never in the Bible did they ever shake hands and give the right hand of fellowship and call it the Holy Ghost? Never did anybody raise up and say, Now I'm a believer and receive the Holy Ghost? If it did, here's the way the Acts 2 would have read. And um, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, down the road come a Roman priest, and he had his collar turned around. He walks up and said, All of you stick out your tongue, now and take the Holy Eucharist First Communion. Wouldn't that be some way to read Acts 2? Well, you Protestants are as bad. Come back right there. Now we walk up to you Methodists, put them on the right hand, of, give them the right hand of fellowship and six months on probation. Where do you read that in Acts 2? Where do you get that? See, it said when they were all in one place and in one accord. There never come up no bishop and done this, and there never come up no priest and done this, but there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. There's the way they received it. Yes, sir. As a rushing mighty wind coming from glory, not up the road or from some denomination, you have a name that you're living, but you're dead. See? Your creeds and denominations that barred God away like that to that we believe this and we believe the days of miracles is past. It's a false prophet that says that. It's a false prophet that tells you that you can shake hands and receive the Holy Ghost. It's a false prophet that tells you you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe. It's a false prophet that tells you you should be poured and sprinkled instead of baptized. It's a false prophet that tells you to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost when there's no scripture part in the Bible. That's right. There's not a scripture in the Bible tells you to be baptized where anybody was ever baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ. Only John's disciples and they had to come be rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to get the Holy Ghost. That's right. Now that's not Jesus' only doctrine. I know Jesus' only doctrine. That's not it. That's just Bible doctrine. That's right. But there you are. What do you do with it? There's your mammy. There's the mammy of those creatures. Now you look right back in the Bible and tell me where anybody was ever sprinkled. Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic. Tell me where one person's ever sprinkled in the Bible. Tell me where one has ever poured in the Bible for remission of sins. Mention it. Can you find it? If you do come to me and I'll walk down the street with a sign on my back and say, A false prophet, I've been wrong. Or you find one place in the entire Bible where anybody was ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The way 80% of you has been baptized. Find me one scripture where anybody was ever baptized that way and I put a sign on my back, false prophet, and walk down the road like this. And show me where anybody was ever baptized in the new church that didn't have to come and be rebaptized over in, not in the name of Jesus only, but in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. See if that isn't right. And here, what is it? She was a mother of harlots. What was made her a harlot? What made her a whore? Her doctrine. What made them a harlot? Her doctrine. And that's the reason we don't tolerate with their denominations and their dogma. We stay clean with this Bible. I don't know how well you live it, but you're taught it anyhow. 
That's up to you. I can't make you live it. I can only tell you what's the truth. That's why we're not a denomination. I wouldn't wouldn't want to defile ourselves to get into such a stuff as that has to knock down in some kind of a dogma. I'd rather take the way with the Lord's despised few. I'd rather stay clean and pure before the Word and God and stand there and say there's no man's blood upon my garments. That's why we stay at the Branham Tabernacle. That's why we're not assembly. That's why we're not oneness. That's why we're not Jesus only. That's why we're not Methodist. That's why we're not Baptist. It's just a, a little tabernacle here. We don't have no denomination at all. We're free in Christ. That's why we stay the way we do. And God has blessed us. God helping us. Now we tell you why we take communion. We tell you why we take feet washing. Why we won't let the members take it if we know they're in sin. And that's why this last two or three weeks I've been going from one member to the other. Where you've been having your little fusses around too. Go around one and speak to the other and pass one another on the road and turn your head. Shame on you! Who's tucked a blessed cup of God across this the altar here and calls you brothers and sisters and then get on the telephone and get off about one another? You're not fit to be called Christian. That's what you're right. You keep off them telephones. If you can't talk good about somebody, don't you talk at all. Remember, God's going to hold you responsible as long as that kind of spirit's in you. You know you're not right with God. If you don't feel if a man's in the wrong, go to him and be reconciled. If you can't be reconciled, take somebody with you. No wonder God can't discipline his church. Because you're not doing it right. Instead of getting on the phone and talking about this and what's taking place in little cults and so forth around like that, instead of doing that, why don't you do what the Bible says? If some brother's been overtaken in the fault, go to him. And see if you can't get reconciled with him. Well, now, he did me, so I don't care what he did. Go to him anyhow. It didn't say for him to come to you. You go to him if he's wrong. It didn't say, well, he was in the wrong. He ought to come to me. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said for you to go to him. If he's wrong, you go to him. And then if he won't listen to you, then take somebody with you as a witness. And then if you want to see that witness, then say, now I'll take your pastor. Then you tell him, say, I'm going to tell it to the church. And in 30 days from now, if you, brother, haven't made that up, this brother here is willing to be reconciled, you won't do it. And if you won't make that up within 30 days, then what's going to happen? You're no more one of us. The Bible said, if you won't, you're the church, then let him be unto you as a heathen and a publican. You see, as long as a brother is under that protection of the church, the blood of Christ is protecting him. That's the reason we don't get the church rolling on the way it does. Now, I, this is the doctrine of the, Bab, uh, the Baptist Church of the Brand Tabernacle here. If you'll do it. See, why can't you, you get here, say, for instance, two men. Say, Leo and I. Well, you have it, I say, well, Leo, he wronged me. That don't make any difference. I'm supposed to go to him. Well, he's a member of this church. He's, he's become a Christian. He's taken the communion here at the rail with me. And we've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Walked up right as brothers before each other. Then something happens. It ain't the man. Ninety percent of the time, it's the devil got between the people. It ain't the people. It's the devil. And as long as you let the devil do it, that's your harming your brother. That's right. Well, something's wrong with Leo and I. Let's go make it up. If you see there's something, it's your duty to come to us and say, both you boys come here and get together. We go straighten this thing up. Now, then if he comes to there and they come to find out then, here we are. I say, well... First thing, if we, we can't agree, then you come to the church like that. And then if, as long as you don't do nothing about it, oh, the blood of Jesus Christ protects us both. See? Well, then that, that old cancer will start another cancer. And that cancer will start another cancer. And the whole thing will be sick all over the whole church. Then you get to a place, you come into church, and there's this cold, you'll have to have the janitor come break the icicles out before the congregation can get in. Now, you know that's right. The cold, somebody sat around, you know, and just don't say nothing. No. We used to be so spiritual. Oh, what happened? You didn't run well. What was the matter? Yeah. See? Your sin separates you. God will hold you responsible for it, brother. Now, I'll straighten this thing up. Nothing but wrong with me, nothing wrong with Leo. It's the devil got between us. I'll try to get the thing straightened out. Go to him. Then if he won't listen... Or I won't listen. Whichever way it is, then tell it to the church. If he don't come be reconciled to that church in 30 days, 
then he's out from under the protection of Jesus. We loose him. 